Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, we will wrap the week, our normal Friday routine of seeing how the markets have evolved Friday to Friday. It's been an interesting week with stocks showing a bit more of a risk off posturing, certainly yesterday and Thursday session, but following through today, closing more in a position of weakness rather than strength with the S&P down below 3770 again. So what does this mean for the big picture? How do we see these trends evolve as investors rotate more to the defensive side of the ledger here on a Friday. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we make sense of these markets together, looking at the language of the uh, of charts, looking at the language of the markets illuminated through the charts, focusing on investor behavior, decision-making, trends, momentum, et cetera. As you may or may not have noticed, we've taken a couple days off, unfortunately, due to, uh, to some challenges here. We had big storms in Western Washington earlier in the week. Some of us still without power after, uh, after four days. We are fingers crossed gonna be back in our house tomorrow, but we're coming at you from a hotel in the Redmond area. Family all safe and sound, house uh, standing and powerless, and uh, hopefully we'll get back to normal soon, but appreciate you hanging with us. A couple of our guests uh, this week, Julius DeKempner and, uh, and uh, Doug Bush as well, both send their regards and agreed to come on. Uh, again, we're super flexible and we appreciate it. Uh, but look forward to hearing from them again soon. We have some other great guests coming up for you next week on Tuesday the 19th. Uh, as a reminder, sorry, Monday, we have uh, the holiday. So no live show on Monday. We'll come back on Tuesday with Chris Shavaco from Shavaco Capital. Uh, Chris is a fantastic uh, just market thinker, market historian. I always just get a lot of, of things to think about when I talk with Chris. So excited to get his take on uh, on the world. Joe Rabel from Rabel Stock Research on Wednesday the 20th. Uh, Joe has uh, made his career around uh, working with institutional investors and giving them technically oriented buy and sell ideas. So we'll see what is top of mind for him. And then Sam Burns from Mill Street Research joined the show on Thursday. Sam's a macro strategist, does a great job of just making sense of the big picture, all the headwinds and tailwinds. And it's always helpful to compare that to what we're seeing on the charts. Most important thing I can tell you, though, is tomorrow on Saturday, January 16th, our market outlook panel will be unleashed called Charting Forward 2021. I listened to a bit of a preview. Uh, Grayson Rosa agreed to host it, did a great job bringing together uh, a fantastic list of experts. People like, people like uh, Gina Martin-Adams from Bloomberg, Tony Dwyer from Dwyer Strategy, uh, Mary Ellen McGonigal, uh, it's just a fantastic group. A lot of different disciplines represented, Rick Benson or others, uh, you know, coming at the markets from a lot of different perspectives, but all asking them the same questions about what they see over the course of 2021. And, and just from the little amount that I was able to watch uh, earlier this week, I, I think you're really going to enjoy it. So that's Charting Forward 2021. Uh, it drops on Stock Charts TV this Saturday, the, uh, the 16th, and also on our YouTube channel. Let's get on to our core segment for, uh, for this day, which is called Wrap the Week. What we love to do is focus on uh, week to week, Friday to Friday, how things are evolved. We ask you a brief poll uh, recently on Stock Charts TV, which sector performs better through the end of March 2021, excuse me, 2021, consumer discretionary or consumer staples? The overwhelming winner was consumer discretionary, far outpacing uh, staples by an almost five to one ratio, if not a little more. Um, you know, it, interesting, and, I, and it's hard for me to disagree with that. I think over when you think through the end of March, the question is how much does the market pull back? and how much do more defensive sectors like consumer staples do well. If you look at today's trading though, on a day which was a bit more of a risk off day, a day where people were rotating out of offense and into defense, they were not rotating much into consumer staples, they were rotating into utilities and real estate, you know, maybe some of the higher yielding uh, parts of the market. So you know, overall something like utilities doing well, I could see that, especially if the market is 
you know, flat to down through the end of February. And, uh, you know, the first quarter is more of a, uh, of a, of a net loss for stocks. I could see something like utilities doing well, maybe because of a flight to income. Uh, but something like Staples would be a tough one to, uh, to vote for until you see some material improvement. Having said that, there are some interesting charts in material, something like um, Molson cores, right? Tap is something that's actually scoring pretty well on the scooter ranking. So if you do want to be in those sectors, I would look for opportunities where they rate pretty, uh, pretty high relative to other stocks. Let's continue on our wrap the week. What we uh, what we'll do is start with a chart of the, uh, of the S and P and how they've, uh, how it's performed versus its peers. We'll refresh here for the uh, close. Here's where things netted out over the last five trading days. The S&P down one and a half percent. And that weakness really came in the last uh, couple of days. Uh, Monday was down as well. And so those three really uh, pushed the index lower. So only one thing underperformed the S&P over the last week. That was the NASDAQ 100 down two and a quarter percent. Everything else outperformed uh, the stocks over the last uh, over the last week. Gold was down about one and a quarter percent. Emerging markets down 0.7 percent. And that's interesting. A lot of that came today. Things like China and India coming off you know, all-time uh, long-term highs for sure. And crude oil down a quarter of a percent uh, energy, and that's coming off of, uh, you know, being one of the best here as of Thursday. So energy certainly mean reverting down to, uh, to the downside today. Bonds actually up a third of a percent. This is, uh, you know, coming off of a pretty rough stretch for bond prices. Yields obviously have gone higher. The dollar recovering a bit as well, up 0.9%. The dollar index Overall has been weaker, but you're starting to see just the beginning of what could be uh, a short-term improvement in the dollar. Be interesting to see if that's the beginning of something or just a bounce before the next leg lower. And then and small caps, even though they gave back some ground today, still up 1.4%. And that outperformance of small caps, I think, is one of the key themes from the fourth quarter that is extending into the first quarter and 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 most likely beyond. I, you see things like regional banks, a lot of the regional banks, and and also the larger banks reporting earnings next week. It'll be interesting to see what results we get and if that continues to show uh, or give improvement to those areas of the market that have been uh, struggling a bit on a relative basis over the long term, but really coming into their own over the last three to six months. Now, one thing I did not include in this list was Bitcoin. If we look, oh, that's the same one. If we look at the chart that includes Bitcoin, you'll see all the things we just talked about are up here. And here's Bitcoin down at the bottom, ended up being down 12%. Now, Bitcoin obviously is a super volatile instrument. So I hesitate sometimes to incorporate it into a traditional asset allocation look because it tends to be either way at the top or way at the bottom. It is, it is absolutely an outlier because the percent swings are so exaggerated. Having said that, Bitcoin certainly rallied up to 42,000 now, you know, sort of backing and filling between 30,000 on the lower end, 42,000 on the upper end. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if we spend more time in that broad, huge range backing and filling for a while. There's plenty of you know, demand out there that has put that has pushed cryptocurrencies, especially Bitcoin to, you know, much higher levels than they've been historically. The question is, at what point does that become unsustainable? We may have seen that with uh, Bitcoin bouncing off of, uh, of 42,000. We'll have to see going into next week now that it's sort of rebounded a little bit and now pulled back today. You know, do, is this the beginning of a next leg lower? Do we hold 30,000 or do we get below there uh, and, uh, and so forth? Let's continue on this discussion by looking at the Mindful Investor Live uh, chart list is where we want to spend most of our time. If you've not seen this list of charts before, this is something I maintain uh, through my blog. So if you go to uh, the member dashboard, click on, or any of the stock chart pages, click on articles. On the upper right, you'll see all stock charts, blogs, and you'll see mine, which is called the Mindful Investor. At the top of that page is a link to this live chart list. I keep them updated pretty regularly. So you're welcome to follow along there. Download it to your own uh, log in if you like and uh, and tweak them as you uh, as you see fit. Overall, the market trend model has remained positive, and I have it in three phases: long term, medium term, and short term. This one is all driven by weekly data on the S and P uh, uh, ETF SPY. The long term model has been positive since early June of last year. The medium term model turned positive in May of 2020. Did a bit of a head fake there in October. Turned back more positive right at the beginning of November and has remained positive since then. The short-term model jumped around a little bit and, and came very close to uh, the zero line this week. Actually, earlier today it, uh, and, and yesterday, it looked like uh, we might see a close below the five-week exponential moving average, which is the green line here at the top. That would trigger uh, a sell signal on the short-term um, model. It did not, which means as of, uh, as of this Friday, we've locked in another uh, bullish configuration. Top uh, long-term, medium-term, short-term, all positive. 
And that sounds about right. Uh, the first thing that would trigger uh, would be a short-term sell signal. So we'll have to see next week if there's enough of a pullback, if we remain uh, muted a bit, uh, flat to down from this week would certainly um, trigger a sell signal most likely on the short-term model. Now, when the market starts to get uh, a little pullback, the question always is, what do you do? Especially when the market's coming off uh, all-time highs and, and a lot of stocks are in a similar situation, things like China and India, when they've had such an imp impressive run, they're at new highs. You know, there's no real support levels potentially nearby to look at. So I found trend lines and moving averages are some of the easy ways you have a sort of a built-in trailing stop. What this trend line is telling you from the October low and connecting that to the December low is basically this is tracking this uptrend over the last, uh, the last two and a half months. As long as we remain above that line, there's nothing really wrong with the trend. The trend is sort of continuing at a regular pace. If it gets really far from that trend line, you may want to redraw it because now it's accelerating and you want to rethink uh, sort of the pace of that trend. If we break down through the trend line, that's when you have to rethink, okay, this trend is no longer in place. Something's different. Something's changed. Either there's a distribution, there's a consolidation, something, but it uh, it causes you to revisit it. So that's why I think trend lines on this wall are, are not a trading system. I wouldn't uh, suggest something like that, but I would tell you that it is a really good visual representation of a trend and a break of a trend line like this can be a great early warning that something might be changing that you want to revisit it. This trend line was touched today, uh, but not broken. So going into next week, it'll be interesting to see if we're able to hold that trend line. If and when we do break it, I would immediately be looking down to these swing lows from mid-December, which are just below uh, sort of that 36.50 level. Also the 50-day moving average, which is around 36.65, 36.70. Um, so the market coming out of an overbought condition that was last Friday, now testing trend line support. If that holds, the trend uh, persists going on into next week. If that breaks, next week we'll start talking about some further downside uh, risk potential. I think the overall feel I have is that I would not be surprised if we retest sort of this 3200 to 3250 level and or the 200 day moving average uh, in, as part of a deeper pullback within January to February. That's sort of the base case I've been talking about. As we'll see in a little bit, I think the euphoric sentiment conditions are something that gives me a little more conviction in that. Uh, than I might have seen uh, elsewhere. Our next chart just speaks to the breadth conditions and I will summarize for you very quickly. The breadth is resoundingly positive. This is the uh, advanced decline lines, cumulative advanced decline lines for the S&P, mid caps, small caps, and then at the top, it's the New York Stock Exchange, common stocks only. All of these have made new highs in the last uh, week. All of them are seeing a pattern of higher highs and higher lows until we get some sort of divergence between these lines and the price line, it's telling you overall uh, the trend is positive. These are not updated yet for today, which today was obviously a bit of distribution relative to earlier in the week, but still it, it, it most likely, uh, if not absolutely, is not gonna be enough to you know, cause a huge reversal in these lines. Overall, the trend remains very positive, especially in small caps, which speaks to the underlying strength of the market. We have seen a steady uh, improvement in the number of new highs, new 52-week highs at the bottom. This is the S&P 500. You can see on the strongest days, which is about a week and a half ago, you had about 20, 23% of the S&P making a new 52-week high on a given day, which is pretty healthy. That's actually the sign of a, of a very healthy market. Since then, we've seen less and less. So less and less stocks pushing higher. The S&P itself not getting to a new 52-week high. So uh, certainly seeing uh, less uh, euphoria in, as measured by breadth, but overall remaining uh, pretty elevated, right, uh, overall. Most stocks in, in the S&P 500, uh, almost uh, actually nine out of 10 above their 200 day moving average until we see some change in that. Overall, it's telling you the breadth remains very strong. I, again, a concern of mine is just that it's so high. And when I see th something like that so extended, I immediately have a contrarian hat that I have to find and put it on and think, all right, has, you know, has this spoken to a, an exhaustion. And, and for me, breadth is, is less telling you exhaustion. It's telling you more strength. It's telling you more about the underlying characteristics of stocks. The concern is more when the market rallies on lower breadth than when the market rallies on stronger breadth. Stronger breadth usually means a stronger market. And so overall, uh, holding up just fine. Getting into some sentiment readings, this is where things uh, really start to get euphoric. We talked about euphoria back here in November into December when things like the AAII survey, things like the name exposure index at extreme highs, we had a bit, bit of, a, of a right sizing of those values going into year end where it felt like less and less. Now there's been some weird uh, data points from the AAII. They actually retracted some values after they put them out. Latest is they have not confirmed these last values. This was a, a value they showed uh, about a day ago and then now have since removed. So I'm not 100% sure and we're, and we're 
trying to work with the AAII to get uh, confirmed values, but talking to some of my peers in the industry, we're all sort of scratching our heads at the moment. But the reading we saw was 54% bulls, which if that tr it's true, um, that's the highest we've been since November. And that's also the highest we've been since uh, January of 2018, which is just before a pretty significant market pullback. So that level of euphoria could be a bit of a concern. Um, one more uh, maybe sign of euphoria, just to pivot very quickly. I don't want to miss this one. Here we go. Sentiment. I want to show you this chart, which is the name exposure and the, uh, the ride X flows. The name exposure index is out almost at 107%, which means active investment managers in the survey are net leveraged long. They're over 100% long. That actually is very rare. This level is the highest uh, it's been in quite a while. We did reach these levels in August, just before the pullback into September. We reached these levels in November, where we did not get much of a pullback. We continued to plow higher. We also got this uh, sort of extended value in December, of 2017, which is about a month before what ended up being a fairly significant uh, peak after the 2017 uh, cyclical bull run. So again, we're at these euphoric levels. So price, very strong, breadth, very strong. And I, I would say supporting the uptrend, uh, euphoria from sentiment measures. The other one we, we're not looking at yet, uh, the put call ratios at extreme lows. When you look at the equity one in particular, telling you, um, you know, options investors are, are sort of all in on one side on more of the bullish side, which is a contrarian uh, sell signal. I think that's about it. The only other thing I wanted to point out, semiconductors continue to do very well. Small caps continue to do very well versus large caps. So a lot of the characteristics of outperformance in terms of value over growth, small over large, uh, et cetera, all still in place. So we haven't seen a huge reversal in these ratios telling you about a huge change of character in the markets. At this point, still feels like a, a healthy pullback and you're looking to see how support is tested on the market as a whole, but also on some individual stock charts. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close for The Final Bar. And again, thanks for sticking with us this week as we deal with uh, power outages in the area here in Seattle. Uh, but a pleasure to be back with you today here on, uh, on Friday the 15th. As a reminder, we love to hear from you. We got some great questions to share with you here in a minute from our mailbag segment. I just want to remind you, shoot us an email with any questions that come up as you're looking at charts, as you're hearing things on social media, seeing things on financial television, from research that you're reading, whatever it is, uh, shoot us an email, let us know what you're looking at. The final bar at stockcharts.com is our email. On Twitter, look us up at final bar SCTV and give us a follow there. On our YouTube channel, just put a comment right below the video and, uh, and we'll be happy to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment, which should be on Tuesday's show of next week. Having said that, let's open the final bar mailbag and answer some of your questions uh, from the last couple of days. Question number one, what are your thoughts on SPACs like CRHC? SPACs, if you've not heard of a special purpose acquisition company or acquisition corporation, I forget what the C stands for, but same idea is basically um, gives individual investors the, the ability to uh, get into private equity like things. It's a, it's a company basically created to um, you know, to invest in other companies. So it's a, it's a publicly listed thing that gets to uh, get you access to private companies essentially and, uh, and, and things that are not IPOing, but raising money uh, in other ways. So, you know, what does that mean? Uh, CRHC was the one you, you mentioned in particular. I'll, the, the problem I would guess, yeah, I was going to say, having, I mean, not looked at this one very, very much, but just get based on my, um, familiarity in my experience with uh, with SPACs. The problem is a lot of them are very new. This concept is relatively young. And so a lot of these are sort of going public here in the last fall, right? And and I'll tell you what concerns me is when there's a run of new ETFs or ETF like products created. Um, that always is a concern because it tells you, you know, people create new products when they think they can sell a lot of that new product. And so a lot of these coming online are to try to get individuals to participate in, uh, in private equity like uh, experiences overall, certainly 
you know, private equity as a whole has been compelling for institutional investors. The question is how viable are they for individuals? The challenge I have with some of these, they're just a little illiquid, right? And you can see the price data looks a little choppy. Um, there's also limited price data. So as a technical analyst, my ability to understand price dynamics relies on having a good amount of data. So I'll never forget uh, the day of Facebook's IPO, which was obviously a lot of excitement about it. And, and one of my peers, whose name I will not mention, went on financial media was asked, what do you think of Facebook? And they had a you know, discussion about Facebook's price on the IPO date. And I, my answer was, I, you know, I, I don't know how you can answer that legitimately given something with not a lot of price history. You need to have enough price history to really understand the dynamics of what's going on there. So having said that, I think at the beginning when things are just getting going, which a lot of these are, you're, you're, you're simply looking at highs and lows. You're looking at how the trend begins to evolve. And what I'm seeing from a lot of these is they certainly have improved as there have been a demand for these instruments, higher highs and higher lows. As long as that pattern continues, I'd feel okay with it. As once that pattern starts to not be the case, I would start to be concerned and I would be uh, avoiding them very, very quickly. Uh, something like C CRHC, it, it's actually very similar to other things we've seen with a trend coming out of lows. I'd be drawing a trend line off of these lows. I would see if we keep making higher highs and higher lows. When that pattern breaks, I would be uh, avoiding it. So overall, limited price data. I did look at this other one. There's a uh, um, uh, Defiance uh, SPAC derived ETF, which went live uh, in October, similar sort of thing. You can see it's making higher highs and higher lows. So yeah, if it pulls back, I'd be looking for support around the previous lows. I'd be looking at the 50 day moving average. Uh, again, what concerns me with a lot of these is just limited price history, uh, which means there's limited understanding of the technical, technical characteristics. I'm also seeing a lot of bearish divergences as I was flipping through some of the ones that I have seen before. So I'd be cautious about that as well. Question number two, this is with RRG. Why is the weakening quadrant small and the improving quadrant significantly bigger? And I'll show you what you were, uh, what you had. You actually sent this uh, chart here and basically saying, what does it mean that this improving quadrant is so big and the weakening quadrant is so small? So, you know, the way that uh, Julius de Kempener designed RRG, the relative rotation graphs, it shows the um, things, the sectors usually for me, and how they're rotating around the benchmark in the middle. The distance from the zero point shows you the relative rotation. So the further they are away, the bigger the price swings or the swings in relative strength uh, uh, relative to others, right? And there's not, the, these are not hard X axes and Y axes, meaning the values are very fluid depending on what happens. So energy has been an outlier. So when you look at, you know, when I hit max, which basically says spread this out so it can include all the data, you can see that energy has been way off in no man's land and has been sort of its own thing. Everything else is sort of there in the middle. If you hit things like fit and max, you can shrink and, uh, and zoom in. You can also just use the mouse and zoom in and out or use the plus and minus to, uh, to do so. So having said that, what does that mean? That just means that energy is a huge outlier and it's basically skewing the whole chart to accommodate for the fact that it's, uh, that it's gone up there. Um, if you hit something like max, it'll normalize it a little bit. You can also just drag the whole thing and put the zero line in the middle. I do that sometimes. So I'm not as skewed about uh, these relative movements and things will just go off the viewable area if they, if, they, uh, if they need to. But having used this visualization a lot, I sort of, can, the moment I see something like this, I know something's way, it's, it's very much an outlier far away from the benchmark and rotating in a big way. And that's what's skewing the visualization. So that's, that's all that you're seeing there. Next question, is it another rainy day in Washington? That, that was just your intro. And actually, no, I can tell you it's bright and sunny here, which is uh, pretty shocking this time of year in, uh, in Redmond. Can you give me your observation on Virgin Galactic? It was at $34 in December after a failed attempt to space. It pulled back down, uh, et cetera, et cetera. New ETF. Let's look at SPCE and see what we can see here. I have not looked at this one. Uh, in a uh, little while. It's not on my normal list of things. So, you know, what's interesting, what, what's, what's interesting about Virgin Galactic is overall, the trend isn't bad. And if you zoom out a little bit, you see it's making a pattern of higher highs and higher lows. What's happening is potentially right now that might be changing a bit. We may be at a failed high here. And, and if you take that as a bit of just a uh, fluff above the, the high, the high close is here around 34. That's right where we reached this week before pulling back a little bit. So I think that's a really key resistance level. Something like this, I'd be pretty happy if it gets above 34, ideally on increasing volume, that would be a sign of encouragement and I would be uh, you know, more compelled to want to follow this uh, higher. Uh, otherwise though, I think you're looking at, at more of a backing and filling, which is what I would probably assume based on what I've seen overbought at resistance pulling back today. That doesn't seem 
particularly strong. Uh, a, a break above 34 would invalidate that thesis. But I'd be looking more for a pullback here to the 50-day pullback to this congestion area, at which point I think that's totally reasonable to expect you know, a bounce off of this trend line and a move, uh, a move higher. Uh, interesting chart, though. And really, if you look at the last year, really range bound, right? I mean, it's still bounded by that range from February to March, which is a little unusual. Next question, what gauge or indicator can I use to measure a specific stock's volatility? And we don't have much time, so I'll just go quickly through this one. Um, the question was volatility. Two indicators that come to mind uh, that are really specific to volatility. One would be average true range. The other would be um, standard deviation. These are similar, but a little different. You can see if you look at the lines, I would assume they're looking very similar, which they are on, uh, on Virgin Galactic here. So you can see in general, these two move to get together. Average true range is something that Wells Wilder created. He's the same guy that invented um, RSI and DMI and the ADX line, parabolic studies, created a number of indicators in the 1970s, uh, really to, to help uh, him understand commodity price changes. Um, ATR average true range basically is the range, the high to low, but it adjusts for gaps. So if yesterday's close was outside today's high or low, it includes that as part of the range. So it's essentially a true range or an estimation of what price swings you could expect on an average day. And it's looking at the last 14 days here. So the lower that number, the lower the range, the higher that number, the broader the range, more volatility, higher range. And you can see it spikes up or comes down. Standard deviations does nothing with the uh, um, high and low. It's just the closing prices. How far do the closing prices deviate from the average closing price over a period of time? Here we're looking at the last 10 days and you do squaring, square roots, and math. And if you go to our chart school page, it explains in detail how we calculate both of these indicators. But they're similar ideas. They're based on how much the price is deviating um, from sort of uh, uh, an average price, how much are fluctuating. Standard deviations, how much it's fluctuating from an average over time based on closing prices. Average to range shows you the daily trading range adjusted for gaps. And I would think about one of those two if you're looking for, uh, for, for, for some color. We need to uh, wrap the show and go right to the three and three. Thanks so much for those great questions. We have more to get to. We'll get to them on Tuesday's show. Chart number one of the three and three is looking at small versus large. We're looking at the last three years, uh, sorry, a little further, the last five years or so. And what I just wanted to show you here is the fact that small cap outperformance still um, impresses me because I am so used to small cap stocks underperforming. From the 2007, uh, 2017 down to March of 2020, it was all about the FANG stocks and mega, caps, mega cap stocks outperforming the smaller end of the uh, of the cap spectrum. So there was really no upside in going small uh, and investing in small caps over large caps. You're better off just parking things in indexes and broad uh, and, and big mega cap names, all else being equal. That has all changed in March. And what I just want to remind people is while, while things like the FANGs have done pretty well, they've, they've, they've taken a breather of sorts and certainly have, uh, have struggled a bit recently, but overall the trends have been fine. But the real juice, the real improvement, the real impressive runs have come in the small cap space. I don't see that changing anytime soon. Second, that's a, a look at breadth in terms of uh, a look at price in terms of breadth. I would just use this chart to demonstrate the fact that the breadth characteristics are strong and, and you know, excessive breadth, you know, strong breadth to me is not a bad thing. That tells you that participation is broad. I start to get concerned when the price goes higher and there's a lap, lack of breadth support. And just to be clear, we have not seen that yet. These cumulative advanced decline lines keep chipping away at new highs higher highs, higher lows. It's in an uptrend, which tells you the trend overall, until proven otherwise, is fairly, uh, is fairly stable. When we do look at sentiment, though, a number of the sentiment readings I would throw in front of you are, are at euphoric levels or, or near euphoric levels. The uh, put call ratio based on equities, not on indexes, but on, uh, or on total equity and indexes. But this one is the equity only put call ratio, dollar sign CPCE. You can see the shaded area, which shows you the relatively muted level you've had in the put call ratio uh, for the last six or seven months. We are once again at the lows that we have been which are extreme low levels. If you go back for years and years, it's very rare we get this low. And overall, it tends to coincide with market peaks, not with the beginning of further upside. So from put call ratios, from name exposure index, from right X lows, all speaking to euphoria and a high likelihood of, some, uh, of a pullback in stocks. Folks, that is a wrap for this week on The Final Bar. And thank you so much for joining us every weekday uh, after the close for the show. One more time, thanks so much for sticking with us this week as we deal with Challenges weather related. We'll be back with you after the holiday weekend on Tuesday. 
and look forward to talking with them. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great weekend. We'll see you Monday, Tuesday. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.